Susana and the Elders. This is my latest painting. Uh, this is a two feet by two feet oil on wood panel painting based on the biblical story of Susanna and the elders, the two old men that um, harassed her for sexual favors. Um, this is a subject that appears in the book of Daniel and uh, like I said uh, this is my interpretation of the passage based on the painting by Tintoretto whose real name was Jacopo Robusti called Tintoretto this Susanna and the Elders painting is located uh, at the National Gallery of Art here in Washington DC well near near where I live I don't live in Washington DC but it's uh, a couple of miles from where I live but anyway um, I went to see it the last time about a month and a half ago and I got the inspiration to paint my own version of the passage of Susanna and the Elders from the book of Daniel in our uh, Christian Bible. Well, um, we can start saying that I already painted that uh, Tintoretto. I uh, reproduced it, I copied it to study Tintoretto's uh, painting style. It took me about a year to finish it. It's a huge painting, about three uh, by four feet wood panel painting, oil on wood. And uh, it was uh, a very revealing experience for me because I got to study and find out some of the tricks and techniques used by Tintoretto to achieve certain effects on his painting. Tintoretto is my second best or my second favorite Renaissance painting painter uh, just after Titian. Titian is absolutely my, uh, my, my master, my number one uh, favorite painter and Tintoretto is my second uh, favorite painter of the same period. Anyway, both of them, uh, here, here we have a, a picture of uh, Tintoretto's self-portrait. Tintoretto uh, lived a long life. He died at the age of 75 and uh, uh, all his life he spent it in Venice. He was a very strong man. Uh, that's why he was called Robusti. That means the strongest, the strong, the strong man. This is his house. Um, I took this picture in Venice. It's still standing. Um, I think the the second floor is unoccupied. But uh, other than that, this is the property where Tintoretto lived. He had his um, atelier, his uh, workshop, in the bottom floor. But um, anyway, that that was his mansion. Is still is still standing in Venice, and um, very very interesting place to visit. Anyway, going back to his painting, as we can see here, based on the story of Daniel about Susanna, Tintoretto made an interpretation of the passage and uh, depicted Susanna getting ready to take a bath um, late in the afternoon, early evening. And we can see her here uh, being attended by her uh, servant, young maid, which is offering a jar of oil. Back in the day, they didn't use soap. They used olive oil to rub it again uh, all over their bodies. And with a tool, um, a curved dull knife, if you want, they will remove the oil and the dirt from the top of their skin and then they will wash off the rest of the oil in water. Uh, we can see here Susanna. She's uh, 
getting ready to uh, take the oil and spread it all over her body. She, she even has one foot in the water already in the fountain of the gardens uh, in uh, one of her husband's properties. You can see in the background under the arch, which is the entrance to the garden, the two old men uh, talking about how they're gonna approach Susanna with their indecent proposal. This is a very interesting story about the, the indecent proposal and uh, we will discuss it in a minute. About the indecent proposal, we can say that it's a very nice story in the book of Daniel. Daniel tells us the story of uh, this young lady married to a merchant, very um, rich in Babylon. This is happening in the time of the Jewish exile in Babylon, in the early uh, first and second centuries of the Christian uh, era. The story um, is, is uh, a developing story. If we consider that the version that we have nowadays in our Bible is a more embellished uh, tale as opposed to the more basic story of the same subject in the Greek Bible called uh, the Septuagina, which means the 70 books, which is the Greek Bible. But anyway, in the second century, a Jewish writer, Theodosian, uh, embellished the story of Susanna and the elders, which basically uh, is a story of these two Jewish judges, old men appointed to the Sanhedrin as judges of the people, uh, fell in lust with this beautiful young woman, probably in, uh, in her late teens, 18, 19 years old, years of age, married to a very rich merchant in Babylon. Remember that this story is happening in the, during the Jewish exile in Babylon. And uh, one day they decided to approach Susanna and blackmail her, telling her that if, uh, if she didn't comply with their requests, which were sexual in nature, they would um, tell her husband that she was being an adulterous woman, that she cheated on him with a young fellow, and uh, the answer by Susanna was that she would never agree to um, comply with their request. She was a very virtuous woman. She would never betray her faith in God, her morals, her principles. And uh, she refused to, um, to the advances of the, of the two uh, elders. Who, who at the end went back to the Sanhedrin and accused Susanna of adultery. Also, um, they um, got to talk with Susanna's husband. And at the time, adultery was a, uh, a mortal crime, a mortal sin punish, punishable by death. So anyway, the Sanhedrin uh, based on the prestige, the age, their, the position of the two elders, uh, ruled in favor of the accusers, the elders, disregarding um, Susanna's accounts of the events. So they uh, sentenced her to be um, lapidated, uh, a sentence of death where people would throw rocks at her to kill her. And uh, one day when she's been pretty much taken to the area where she's gonna be killed uh, by stoning, uh, Daniel, who's the writer of the book of Daniel, at the time was a young uh, child in his uh, 12th or 13th uh, year of age. So Daniel being a very wise uh, young man who was in training to become a judge to the court of the Emperor uh, Nabucodonosor uh, 
decided to intervene. So he uh, stood in front of the of the crowd, taking Susanna uh, to be killed. And uh, Daniel very very bravely stopped the crowd and told them that they were doing wrong because they never heard Susanna's accounts of the story. They just took the two old men's version and accounts of the event and uh, they never investigated deeply into the situation. So he convinced the crowd to take Susanna back to the courthouse and uh, told them that they needed to interview the two old men separately. So that's what that's what the people do did. They took everybody back to the courthouse. They separated the two um, old men, and uh, they asked them to tell their accounts of the story, which, at the end, uh, were different from one another, especially in the um, in the sense that when they were asked where did they find Susanna cheating on her husband with this young fellow that uh, they failed to mention to begin with. One of the elders said that uh, they were laying down at the foot of a very thick um, tree. The other elder said the same thing, but they were laying down at the foot of a very thin uh, tree. So that's how people realized that the two elders were lying and they um, ruled that Susanna was innocent and they let her go with her virtue restored and uh, her husband received her with open arms and uh, told her that he never doubted her virtue. He never thought uh, she had cheated on him with anyone. So um, everything ends very well for Susanna. But for the two elders, they were sentenced to death because they raised uh, false testimony against an innocent person and they lied. So they were, con they were condemned and they were sentenced to death. But anyway, the moral of the story is that if you stick to your principles, to your morals, if you obey uh, God, if you are a virtuous person, um, even under uh, bad circumstances, even if when you're accused of doing something that you never did, the truth will come to light eventually if you have faith in God and you stick to your principles. Um, another moral of the story is that you shouldn't um, tell lies about other people. Uh, you shouldn't uh, uh, accuse anyone of doing something they didn't do. And there's consequences for that kind of actions, which is in this case, death. It's a very nice story. Anyway, uh, the story of uh, Susanna and the elders sets a um, uh, very interesting precedent for investigations um, in certain crimes. Uh, so it's a very interesting story uh, in the book of Daniel. Going back to my painting that you can observe, uh, you can observe right here. This is my interpretation of Susanna and the Elders, kind of following the steps of Tintoretto's interpretation of uh, the same story. What I wanted to do here and uh, you can't see really uh, right now, that's my signature on a block of marble where Susanna is sitting. But anyway, what I wanted to do here is make my painting as if it were a second scene, a second act on, on this movie or this story where Tintoretto's painting is the first scene where you can see Susanna very calmly getting ready to take a bath um, at about 6.30, 7 p.m. in the, in the evening um, before the elders approach her. Actually, in the, uh, as you can see, in a, in, in a second here, when I put 
Tintoretto's painting back on the screen, you will see that the elders in Tintoretto's painting are under the arch outside the garden. The arch that you can see in the background of the paintings, mine and his, is actually the actually the entrance to the garden uh, where Susan is taking a bath. But anyway, uh, in Tintoretto's uh, painting, the elders are outside talking amongst themselves about how they're gonna approach Susanna and blackmail her. And in my painting, uh, the elders uh, already came into the garden uh, through the, through the uh, arch at the entrance, and they already stalking Susanna. Here in the painting, you can see that I um, use pretty much the same background as Tintoretto's painting to connect the two paintings and uh, establish, like I said, a second scene or a second act of the story. Anyway, uh, I put a lot of emphasis, I put a lot of work on the expressions, on the faces of, the, uh, of my characters here in the, in the painting. You can see this, um, this guy, the, one of the elders, uh, who is uh, more, is, is a little more muscular, taller, thinner than the other um, old man that is approaching Susanna from behind. Um, like you could see the facial expressions are very telling of what's going on in the painting. What I love about um, painting, all on oil on wood panel paintings, is that the painter have to tell a, a long and complicated story using only one image, one frame. Painting is very difficult. It's not like making a movie where you can tell a story in different scenes, in different frames, using voice, movement, color, action, etc, um, etc. Et in painting, you only have one frame and the painter got to use all his talents, all his experience and training to uh, tell a story. Again, going back to my painting here, uh, based on the facial expressions, you can tell that the the story is as it goes. The story is, uh, 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 as I'm talking, I'm going to tell you right now, you have Susanna, who is completely terrified. She's um, mortified to have these two old men approaching her, asking her for sexual favors. So look at her facial expression. She is uh, in panic and she is withdrawn, making her body smaller, covering her body with uh, one arm and with the, with the left arm. She's uh, picking up her tunic, covering her pelvis. And you have the right hand of the old man in red tunic uh, sticking his hand under the under the tunic, trying to touch uh, Susanna. Then you have the, the two elders, based on their facial expressions, are using two different techniques to stalk, to harass sexually uh, Susanna. One is uh, using the, um, the good guy technique, you can have you, you you can see the old man in the yellow or golden tunic is pretty much begging Susanna for sexual favors, and uh, you can see how he is kind of lower in the stature when compared to Susanna, who's in the middle, and the elder with the red tunic in the in in the left. The um the elder in the red tunic. Is using a different approach. He's being more aggressive, more cynical towards uh, Susanna. 
in her in his advances for sexual favors. So you can see how Susana is withdrawing from the elder to my right in the in the golden tunic, but she doesn't count with the fact that the other guy is behind her and is being more aggressive. He's going straight to touch her legs or whatever. And in his facial expression, you can say that uh, you can you can you can pretty much think that he's mouthing words. So he's probably been cynical about the entire thing. Um, Susana is letting go a gasp. You can see her lips are, are parted. Her mouth is open, and she's probably letting go a gasp of panic. And uh, she's looking at the elder in the in the golden tunic with despair. Um, and you can see his uh, expression is like a begging um, expression. But anyway, and another another uh, trick I used for uh, just to set the, the tone of the scene is that the guy that's begging is more lower is lower than the guy who's been more um, aggressive. His, uh, the, the presence of the elder in the red tunic is more aggressive, um, more uh, dominant of the scene, of the situation. He's already grabbing Susanna by the waist or whatever. Um, but anyway, um, it's very interesting how a painter have to, has to um, tell a big story in only one frame. Anyway, going back to the uh, Venetian painting style, we can say that we always start with a with a with an underpainting. In my case, I use a color called uh, salsa red. It's a burgundy, not quite a, a wine a, a red wine color is called salsa red it's a latex treatment in my underpainting i prefer to paint on wood rather than than canvas and uh, the reason is that wood acts like a sponge wood soaks up oil and color and it helps in the long run to give us this three-dimensional effect of the finished painting as I will show you as, uh, as I will show you at the end of this presentation uh, wood is very 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 nice it's a very nice medium I prefer it to canvas also the colors run uh, nicer smoother uh, on wood one day I'm going to dedicate a, an entire video to the preparation of the wood before applying the the underpainting, the red bowl, it's, that, that's exactly how it's called. That red background is called red bowl. And uh, in my case, again, I use a color called um, red salsa, and it's a uh, water-based painting. Remember that you can never paint oil on an oil underpainting. Always paint uh, um, lean on fat. You never go fat on fat because you will have cracklier, you will crack uh, the surface of your painting. So lean over fat and uh, fat over water. In this case, oil over latex, water based painting. Okay, once we have talked about. Uh, the story of Susanna and the elders from the book of Daniel and the Bible and uh, after we touch some uh, aspects of the composition we can now start um, talking about the actual process of painting in the Venetian style the Venetian style was developed in Venice and uh, over the centuries probably started in the um, early 15th century and was developed furthermore 
with the invention of the oil colors. Before that, painters used tempera. Tempera is a very difficult procedure. It's a very difficult technique because you have to uh, use um, eggs as your medium. The yolk of an egg mixed with the color. And the problem with tempera is that the paint doesn't run as well as with oil. Then the other problem was that tempera dries too fast, doesn't give you the time to um, to design your painting uh, slowly and making modifications, doesn't let you spread the painting either over bigger surfaces. With the invention of oil, the Venetian technique evolved very fast. Uh, painters then were able to paint bigger paintings faster, uh, get brighter, uh, fuller colors, uh, use different um, or colors or, or, or a more a bigger variety of colors as opposed to just the basic colors and uh, that allowed painters like Titian uh, and Tintoretto in this case or the Veronese the Veronese painters to master uh, the oil technique they painted they decided to start painting on canvas rather than wood panel and the reason is that wood panels are way more expensive as a um, uh, as, as, a, as a place to paint as a medium to paint for example uh, a piece of wood like the one I used for this painting I'm showing you right now guys which is about 2 feet by 2 feet 24 by 24 inches and it's about I want to say 1 quarter inch thick if you want to use that kind of um, wood especially if it's poplar which is uh, the wood preferred in the northern part of Europe as opposed to oak in the south so poplar is a very expensive wood even if you go right now to a um, to a construction material store like Lowe's or Home Depot if you are lucky enough to find a board of wood that big to begin with uh, and on those dimensions I just gave you two by two by a quarter inch thickness you're gonna pay about 75 to 80 dollars for a good quality board so if you're a professional painter and you paint a lot you're gonna spend a lot of money just in wood and that is just the bare wood let alone forget about the preparation the materials to prepare the wood and uh, forget about the cost of the paint itself but anyway the other problem with wood is the, the the size you cannot find big sizes of wood and uh, in order to get big panels you have to put different size boards glue them together nail them to frames and then you have the problem of having that uh, line in between the boards that will never disappear and the other problem with painting on wood is that over time wood sh changes shape um, bends uh, warps cracks and uh, depending on the um, the humidity contact content of the air where the board is kept you will have the board absorbing that water from the back of the panel and soak into the fibers of the wood and change the shape expand the fibers contract some other fibers depending on the weather if it's cold or it's uh, hot in summer and uh, you will have that over the years we're talking about decades maybe a couple of centuries that board will definitely um, destroy the, the the final product that is one of the reasons why um, painters in the past 
uh, weren't too fond of using wood uh, as a medium. Um, the other problem with wood is the weight. Wood is very heavy, especially oak and poplar. The problem with weight um, is that it's very difficult to ship. The other problem is that you are limited by the size of the board to what size is your painting going to be at the end. So wood panels are reserved for small paintings, portraits, small landscapes, etc. And another problem with painting on wood is the shipping. If you have a final uh, painting, and for example in the case of Titian, he received commissions from all over the world, the known world in his time. So if he painted his beautiful creations on wood, it would have been very difficult to ship these paintings to the final um, owner, to the commissioner of the painting. And uh, we all know that Titian shipped a lot of paintings, of his paintings, uh, to Spain, to Madrid, to the, to the king, Philip II in Spain. So it's very difficult to do this with uh, wood panels. Whereas if you use canvas, now we're going to talk about canvas. Canvas is a very nice uh, medium or surface to paint on because first of all the size of your painting is just pretty much unlimited and uh, as it was demonstrated by by the Venetian painters uh, especially Tintoretto which was a master in painting huge paintings huge um, uh, compositions he painted the biggest ever ever known uh, one piece painting in the world is kept in venice the dimensions the exact dimensions escape my mind right now but we're talking about something in the range of 130 feet long by about 10 feet tall and uh is one of the biggest and the the, the and and he painted he painted this creation himself with little help from his uh, assistants from his uh, workshop. So that tells you how how um, um, more useful canvas are for for painters. Imagine Tintoretto trying to paint that same that same painting with wood panels. First of all, first of all transportation of those wood panels to the place of uh, to the final place for the painting would have been a nightmare try to put those panels together 130 feet long 10 feet tall very difficult to do and uh, painters very seldom painted on site in the place where they were gonna place um, the painting permanently so what they did was paint the canvases in their workshop and then once the, the, the painting was finished they would they would roll the painting regardless of whatever size they, they had and then they would ship or they would transport this rolled up painting on carts and on the shoulders of uh, men to the place of final uh, display so that is one of the advantages actually the greater the greatest advantage of painting on, on canvas as opposed to wood and another advantage for example in the case of Titian we're saying that he painted huge paintings uh, well not 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 as big or as huge as Tintoretto's but he painted panels of uh, 10 feet by 8 feet sometimes uh, 5 feet by 7 feet etc but still he had to ship those paintings to Spain or to the Netherlands or to France or Germany Austria so he he has to he had to finish the painting at his workshop finish it uh, give it the final touches 
then remove the, remove the canvas from the from the frame uh, the temporary frame roll it up very good package it and ship it literally by ship to Spain and that was the easiest way to ship uh, paint uh, products by, by by ship through the Mediterranean Sea or if he was shipping the, um, the, the, the product to northern uh, Europe he would have he would have to send the, the, the painting rolled up in um, and mounted on carts anyway this is the this is the way um, Titian and Tintoretto work with canvas the other thing is that canvas can be better prepared to withstand moisture and water damage it is easier to make canvas more waterproof than it is to waterproof wood boards so that's another advantage and I, I'm telling you this because I work with both mediums but anyway at the end and, and it's a very uh, contradictory note I'm gonna make right now is that even then I nowadays prefer to paint on board because um, most of my paintings are not as big anymore unless I have I have a big commission then I would use canvas but um, for my own studies and uh, the reproductions I make for my own personal museum I use wood and the reason is that nowadays as opposed to 500 years ago nowadays we have different products to um, make wood last longer we can waterproof wood we can't we can nowadays find uh, boards in bigger sizes we can even and, and even even the availability of wood panels is better nowadays than back in the day pretty much back in the in the time of Titian and Tintoretto they had to send their assistants, their employees, to the woods to select the poplar trees, fold them, and process the wood themselves, the wood boards, trying to get the bigger, uh, the biggest uh, boards possible for their masters to paint on. But nowadays, you just go to the to the store and. Uh, just tell what, what size of board do you, are you looking for and they will find it for you, they will give it to you or they can even order it to you and you can get it at home, at your own home, your own house in four or five days. Um, and again, nowadays even the boards come from the, come from the lumber yards already prepared, waterproofed or moisture proofed, etc. And uh, with the Anyway, with all those chemicals we use nowadays, it's easy to prepare wood and make it last and prevent warping and, and excessive drying or excessive uh, cracking due to um, the temper temperature effects on the board. But anyway, um, enough of that. And then next we're gonna talk about the actual painting technique in the Venetian style. Well, about the Venetian style of painting as embraced or developed, mastered by Titian, Tintoretto, Veronese, uh, Giorgione, even Bellini started painting in the so-called Venetian style. Anyway, again, Venetian style means painting either on wood or canvas usually canvas, even though I paint on wood. But anyway, I have uh, modified the style to suit my preference of wood panels. Anyway, the first step after selecting the piece of wood or canvas you're gonna use uh, as, as, uh, as a surface to paint on, you have to prepare the, the medium either the board or the canvas. The preparation of canvas, canvas and wood differ greatly. Um, it's very easy to prepare canvas. You can just 
uh, uh, use a mixture of 50 50 uh, water and uh, Elmer's glue that nowadays is so readily available and so cheap that is my favorite um, uh, chemical to prepare canvas because you want to make it you want to make the canvas waterproof and the easiest way to make uh, fabric in this case because canvas is fabric is cotton fabric if you want to waterproof canvas you got to treat it first the very first step with 50 50 the dilution of Elmer's glue white glue and just regular water it is a little if, if it is um, better not to use cold uh, water to uh, dilute the glue it's best if you just warm it up for a little bit uh, get a lukewarm um, pot of enough water to dilute glue and then with a paintbrush or with a brush um, depending on how big is your canvas an inch or two inch paintbrush you can just go ahead and apply um, the glue uh, the glue dilution I apply this mixture in several coats I apply them also in both faces of the canvas I apply it on the on the side on the side I'm gonna paint on and in the in the reverse in the back and I will tell you why because when you have your painting finish with all the oil layers on top and the varnish the back part of your canvas is an open door to moisture moisture can get through the back of the canvas all the way through the layers of paint and start uh, wreaking havoc on your painting it's gonna crack it mixture of uh, dry oil with water is is terrible water is definitely gonna damage your painting it's not gonna happen in a, in a month or two in a year or two yeah, over the decades the damage is gonna be um, incredible so if you want to preserve your painting for the centuries it's best if you apply the glue um, solution on both sides of the canvas and again the more coats of glue dilution or solution actually dilution solution would mean that you use powder or glue but anyway diluted glue in lukewarm water applied several coats is uh, to your canvas don't overdo it you don't want to end up with a rubbery plasticky feeling canvas either as long as you have the fabric texture you are okay but if you're still if you're adding too many layers of of your glue and you start feeling that you're gonna you're, you're gonna plastify that canvas you, you gotta stop so I will give you a number if you can apply three coats of glue dilution to, to the to the front face and another three to the back of your canvas you're you're okay so you don't you don't have to go um, and, and add too many layers of this solution anyway let the canvas dry all extended spread um, on the on the stretcher if you already have it on or uh, let it hang free so the um, the water dries off and leaves the glue uh, in the fibers of the canvas anyway after the canvas with the glue is completely dry then you can start applying the uh, bowl you see here for example in my painting uh, in the background that reddish is called uh, salsa red it's a latex painting that you can buy at home depot or lowe's and it's a latex painting water-based you apply that in at least two or three coats uh, as your bowl sometimes I've been known to use only one layer of bowl as to depending on the size of the painting if it's a big 
if it's gonna be a big painting I'm talking about in the in the seven by eight or seven by ten feet go for the two or three layers of bowl but if your painting is a small you just need one because a smaller canvas bend uh, uh, a little more than big canvases as long as you have them stretched up on a wood uh, frame one layer of bowl would be enough okay um, after you have the bowl re uh, readily dried and ready to start painting let's go ahead and transfer either uh, pencil your creation I always go freehand um, or if you're reproducing a painting use a, a reticule from the if you have a printout of the painting you're you're about to copy just uh, dry you know a reticule and then you uh, copy the same lines in the same proportions uh, the same aspect or the same ratio to the surface of your painting or your canvas with on, on the bowl. Uh, if you go back and review this uh, this video or some others, you will see that I start with a very good drawing, a very detailed drawing. I even draw the wrinkles or the face or the um, the the freckles because I want to be detailed. Titian, Tintoretto, Da Vinci, and Raphael. All of those painters always emphasize that if you don't start with a good drawing, you're never going to have a good finished painting. The secret to have a beautiful painting at the end after the entire process is finished and you end up varnishing your painted, your, your painted surface, the secret for all that is to start with a very good detailed drawing. And I will tell you this, the drawing is going to guide your hand is gonna save you a lot of uh, mental process the, the the pencil lines are gonna definitely guide your 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 uh, future steps in the painting process anyway here I um, have started the grisale after you have a finished pen drawing detail start with your grisale the grisale is um, this is this video unfortunately doesn't show the just the grease hail, which is this area, this area right there, only white. That that is the grease hail. Unfortunately, this this short video that I'm looking at right now has some color in the background because I already started the color layers. But anyway, this is the grease hail with white titanium white. You gotta start building up the 3D the volume. Of, of all your elements in the painting. Look at the face of this old man just using white and taking advantage of the red bowl in the background you can construct almost like a black and white if the bowl would be black instead of red you would have a finished black and white uh, picture before you start adding the color and Titian always said Color is the last thought in the mind, meaning that if you do not have a good grease cell, you're never going to be able to have a um, realistic painting with volumes and uh, giving that 3D uh, impression. Anyway, I took this video uh, with, with dim light just to show how the um, use of shades and, and, and white lights, white uh, layers of paint helps you push forward your, 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 your characters from the painting. Using the background, dark background, push your, your, your characters forward to give that 3D effect. Here, um, obviously I finish the background, the garden where uh, Susanna was taking her bath She's sitting there on a white marble block and uh, I here already finished adding the layers of color on the old man in the in the gold tunic tunic anyway how do you achieve this color the skin color 
is by adding layer upon layer upon layer of very very thin out oil color very thin transparent and Tishan said that even 40 layers of color is not enough to give the skin uh, the, a realistic uh, uh, feeling so I will, I will be honest with you I at the end of this painting uh, when I finished this painting especially in uh, Susanna's body there were some areas where I had to apply about 50 or 60 layers of different colors to give that skin feeling so um, don't 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 you count the layers just apply until you are satisfied with your final product uh, look at the face of this um, this character right there uh, in some areas you can count easily 20 25 layers of color to give that uh, realistic feeling even even the, the the right shoulder in the back require many layers okay about the tonic the tunic to give that silk uh, texture again I use 20 to 25 layers of of uh, different yellowish colors to give that that feeling this tu this tunic the red one is made of a uh, thicker silk so that's a different texture you gotta you gotta give to this red tunic then what Susanna is uh, wrapping her body with is a, is a thick cotton tunic, almost like a towel, and the texture for that is different. I had to use many, many layers of white and bluish um, and light blue layers of color to give that feeling of thick cotton tunic. Um, what else I can tell you again do not start adding layers of color until you are satisfied with it, with your gray sale because once you start colors you cannot go back and start adding white one big mistake painters make is adding thick layers of white when they want to um, give brightness to some areas for example the forehead of any of these characters just to give you an example if you want to give that whitish bright uh, brightness uh, on the tip of the forehead or in the more the closer part to the observer of the foreheads and if you go ahead and apply an impasto of thick titanium white for example you're just gonna ruin your painting that thick impasto is gonna be it's gonna look horrible to begin with and with time it's gonna crackle your it's gonna crack crackle and 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 the, yeah and if you apply that to the face of a character right there you just lost that character forever you're gonna have a crack crackle here on the, on the forehead or on the nose or whatever so the secret for these uh, bright areas is to start with a good grease ale and don't and kind of be careful I know that nowadays painters like to impasto everything everything's impasto nowadays impasto 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 but if you want to impasto something and you want to add thick uh, areas of paint you got to do that in the grease ale don't do that in the in the upper layers of oil because you're just gonna you're just gonna end up with a unrealistic feeling to your painting that famous impasto is for the grisel only in the venetian style of course i'm talking about the about the venetian style um impasto is for the grisel with white color only and uh, let me tell you about impasto not People think that because you add in past you're going to look good and cool and you're going to look like a good painter. You have to be very careful with impasto. Because impasto is for some areas, for some time, in certain types of texture. But it's not for everything. We're not going to be Rembrandt's here. Impasto everything. Rembrandt was a master of his own technique. But um, if you are working on the Venetian style... That is a different different technique. So please be careful with impastos. I will give you an example for example here. If I want to use impasto, I would use it here on the tunic, on uh, Susanna's white tunic. I would use impasto there in some areas just to give it um, texture. Like here at the bottom in between her legs. I, w I did use a little bit of impasto, but I didn't go crazy with it. I would never use impasto 
on skin surfaces because that looks horrible unless you wanna you wanna emphasize wrinkles on the face of an old person definitely pasto is something and here okay I'll, I'll tell you this I use um, white lines of impasto to give the hair of this guy a little volume a little more realism uh, on his hair but that is a good area to use impasto anyway moving forward so uh, at after you have applied all the colors uh, the layers of color and you are satisfied and if you of oh the other thing is you have to let one layer of oil color dry before you apply the next otherwise you're going you're going to end up with a with a muddy uh, grayish greenish mud color everywhere the secret for the venetian style of painting is that you have to let the different layers of different colors show through as the light goes through them and bounce, bounces back from the red ball back to the retina of the observer. I'll tell you that for example here in the leg of this man I've used several different colors to give that impression that idea of skin. You even one of the layers is actually greenish. I have a layer here of uh, burnt sienna in some areas some um, bluish you, you you can see the bluish part in in the um, in the bottom of the foot uh, white orange and all those layers gotta show through through the other layers that are on top of them so that's why you gotta apply the layers in thin diluted oil diluted uh, thin layers in order to give that uh, effect of 3d and multicolor uh, effect that people love so much about the Renaissance uh, paintings like Tintoretto, Titian, Raphael, Da Vinci, but uh, mainly, mainly the Venetian painters. Um, even in, in 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 the green, the greener areas in the background, I use multiple layers of different colors: blues, yellows, yellow ochres, uh, light blues. Even a layer of um, uh, burnt sienna in some areas. So if you look closely after the finish is painting, I mean the painting is finished, you will see how the the, the there's there's an effect of uh, color changing in some areas. Very nice, very nice. Anyway, we'll continue with the process in a minute. Well, at the end, we just have to add. Um, the layers of color until you are satisfied and again I want to emphasize that don't be counting the layers if it's going to take a hundred layers to achieve an effect on uh, one of the characters of your or one of the elements of your painting so be it um, the more layers you apply the more realistic your your painting is going to be anyway thank you for watching this video don't forget to subscribe, make, make your comments, leave your questions if you have any questions, and uh, share this video with uh, the students of the Venetian style, people interested in the art. And uh, thank you again, and I uh, believe this is all I can do for you guys today. And uh, see you next time. Thank you.